Thank you everyone for joining us. Those were really motivational um, award introductions and speeches. Um, you are all very inspiring. So um, we have a pretty interesting and exciting panel for you today. And I think we're gonna start off with a round of introductions. I'll go last. Um, so Sally, I'm gonna start with you. And each of the folks on the panel sort of represents a different part of this ecosystem as it relates to clean energy policy. So we'll talk a bit about where we fit in that spectrum. And then we'll get into some questions. So, Sally? Okay. Anyway, uh, it's always wonderful to be here. And it's so inspiring to hear all of the awarding stories. And, and actually, I found it really inspiring to hear the ambassadors talk about the awardees. So anyway, thank you. Great to be back here. Uh, so, uh, so as you heard, I lead the Energy Division at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. You're probably going, what's that? <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, it's an organization that's in the ELP or the executive office of the president ecosystem. And our job is to maximize the value of science for health, uh, prosperity, uh, security, environment, and equity. Okay, so so one thing you might not know about our president is he is an enormous fan of, of innovation. He loves to see innovation. He loves to talk about innovation. And because he thinks this is so important, he decided to elevate the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy to a cabinet level person, uh, position. And, and, and that's motivated so much by, I don't know if you've heard this, but he always says, if I have to characterize uh, America by one word, it's possibilities. And, and science and technologies are key to opening up and unlocking new possibilities. So uh, I'm also really excited to say that uh, we have a new director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Dr. Arthi Kravacher, and she is the first woman director of the office. She is the first woman of color uh, director of the office. So anyway, really thrilled to, to work with her. Uh, just quickly to say, what do I do? I, I focus on innovation. Uh, in particular, we're working on a portfolio across the entire federal government of net zero innovation. Uh, we're working to develop a system of data, data analysis that can provide information for evidence-based policy making to steer the energy transition. And then finally, we, we uh, are interested in accelerating innovation that we see sort of, uh, you know, need a little shot, uh, spotlight on that will help. And uh, it was so fantastic to have a discussion about fusion in an energy panel. Uh, that was our first deep dive. Anyway, really excited to see that finally making its way onto the list. Um, also working on electrification, which is really key between a clean grid and electrifying heat. Uh, as well as light duty transportation and certain fraction of industry, that gets us to 56, 50 to 60 percent of the way to a net zero economy. So uh, that's what I do. Anyway, looking forward to a conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, the invitation to be here today. And I, I have to say, I'm a, a technology geek with our portfolio, and that I have no credentials for that, but I really enjoy being working with <laughs> the other panels. Um, my work uh, really focuses uh, in leading the National Association of State Energy Officials on bridging a lot of gaps and moving forward is sort of how I think about it. We represent all 56, 56 states and territories, the energy directors that are designated by their governors, about 80% of them are either governor appointed or serve at the pleasure of the governor, and really covering every energy sector, um, distribution, supply, production, all the major energy sectors. It's a very big portfolio. We move forward and have a, a history of doing almost everything in a bipartisan way, but definitely not a lowest common denominator way. We're looking for the things that often governors are. So how do you get technology innovation for economic development? How do you deal with security and reliability, whether it's power or fuels or a critical facility of some kind? How do you uh, deliver uh, more job growth and diversity uh, in the economy? The panoply of things that we have in the energy area among the state energy offices to address that um, really is what makes it interesting. When I think about where we come together in the grid, for example, and the difference of the theme of this panel, which is policy, I, I often think back to when I first started in the energy area, I was uh, visiting Governor Branstead's uh, energy director uh, when he was governor the first time, a very long time ago, and he had just really set up the first renewable electricity standard about eight or nine years before any other state had. And it wasn't a mandate, but he was serious about it, and he understood energy. 
and they blew through it in a year, and it was policy. And they directed the energy office to look at planning resources, work with the Department of Energy um, to determine uh, what technologies they could bring to, to bear. They worked with farmers to figure out where they could place wind turbines, and they structured a policy, and the investment came. And that's the, the sort of the, the boom of policy that I remember. It's been repeated in so many areas. And I think now, where we sit, at least in our organization with all the states, we have this intersection of federal, state, local, I would even say sub-local and community level, um, and private sector investments. And that's where we sit, uh, both from an innovation perspective, but obviously from a deployment perspective. And, um, we kind of bring that lens to it. So I'll, I'll pause there and pass on. Great. Well, first of all, it's very exciting to be here. I'm Bobby Case Garnick, and in my current job, I'm what they call a professor of practice at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. First of all, I have to thank C3, and to be an ambassador is one of the greatest personal joys of, of my experience. Um, I started out in this field, and I'm not even going to tell you that it was close to 50 years ago, which blows my mind in conversation. But anyhow, I started out at a very different point. I started out right at the time of the um, oil embargo, and it, it was a, a very interesting opportunity to realize what issues in energy meant. And I feel that with the Ukraine situation, we're also at a very similar inflection point where energy security. Oh, they can't hear you. Okay, right can you hear me? Did I not have this on? I'm sorry. sorry. We're at a very uh, critical point where energy security and clean energy is coming together. So, sort of, again, it's the same situation, but now we have to revisit what we mean for energy security. I did a PhD on oil stockpiling. And I just want to talk about three very seminal moments in my own career. I sold the first deregulated electricity in the country to Providence Metallizing, um, which was very exciting at the time when I was part of a company called New Energy. I also wrote the first order on environmental externalities from a public utility commission and the supreme judicial court of massachusetts had the wisdom to say that the puc had no brief on environment so we were really out of our league in writing such an order um, so that was sort of an interesting moment and in the early 1980s i went to germany as part of the team to talk about the import, the first imports of natural gas into Germany. The wall was still up. Uh, the Reagan administration was very concerned that Roar gas was thinking of importing at that point Soviet gas. So you realize we're at a very important inflection point, and the only comment to make is for the first time, and after listening to the speakers and the awardees today, I realize that we have a chance to make a difference. And that's what I sincerely feel that makes this C3E um, meeting even more impactful than many of the other impactful ones we've had before. Wow. That's a little laugh. <laughs> that's equally. Um, good morning. My name is Paula Glover. I'm the president of the Alliance of Safe Energy. Um, and so first of all, I will tell you, um, it was an honor and a thrill for me to be asked to be a C3 ambassador. And Maria called and let me know. I know she heard me scream and was kind of like, what is wrong with this lady? Um, and I use a lot of expletives, what do you want to tell me? Um, you know, a little bit about the Alliance. The Alliance, we are what we call a bipartisan coalition. So part of our membership, we have 130 members. They represent industry, they represent um, environmental organizations, consumer advocates, small business, um, all kinds of organizations. And so we are really looking for the solution. Um, and we focus on energy efficiency and policy that's focused on federal policy around energy efficiency because we believe that energy efficiency is actually foundational to any transition that happens. And so what we want people to think about is the electron that you do not use, the therm that you do not use is far more important than any clean therm that we build or electron that we build and use. Um, and so my career has really not been focused on efficiency, but the intersection of community and energy systems. Um, my very first job 30 plus years ago, 
um, was taking payments from customers. And I always tell my team and others that the most humbling experience you ever will have is taking a payment from a customer when their lights or gas or their heat has been ch- turned off. Um, and it really does make you think about when we say reliable, affordable, equitable, um, it absolutely makes you really rethink what do we mean when we say that. Um, and so we at the Alliance are constantly looking at all of our work through those three lenses, equity, reliability, slash resiliency, and affordability. Thank you. Uh, sorry, let's make sure that yours is going to work this time. But so I'll just introduce myself last. So I'm Ann Show. I, I was delighted to be included uh, and asked to moderate this panel. I've worked uh, almost 30 years on uh, at the intersection of clean energy and climate change. And I have about, well, more than 2,000 people who work for me, and more than half of them are women. So, and those are engineers and scientists and, you know, communications folks and writers and economists. So, anyway, I just think that that's an interesting factoid because, you know, all of you in this room, we are building, you know, we have been and we continue to build this field. And I think a lot of women have been leaders. And there's tons of opportunity for continued growth, obviously. All the conversations we've been having, you know, this is an inflection point. And so I think, you know, the policies we're going to talk about give us an opportunity to really take all that technical expertise and also our understanding of communities and equity and behaviors and really marry them up and change, you know, change the future. So I'm really excited about that. Um, first, I'm going to um, get into a question for Sally to talk a little bit about federally speaking. Um, what are you most excited about and sort of specifically zooming into IIJA and IRA? Okay, well, uh, we've actually talked a lot about the historic legislation that, that's been passed. There's the uh, infrastructure law, the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's the Inflation Reduction Act, and there's also CHIPS and Science. And Secretary Granholm uh, talked about how important this is. Uh, just to put this in perspective, this, uh, this is half a trillion dollars uh, of investment uh, that will unle- un- unlock uh, many, many times more of that from, uh, from the private sector. Um, it, uh, it's all across the economy. So I, I want to step back just for a minute for those of you who are younger than I am. I've been in this, uh, in this uh, area for a really long time. And, and I can say that many times in the past, we you know, took a, taken a run you know, at building legislation uh, that would help us solve this problem. And, you know, there was cap and trade. We got so close, uh, Waxman Markey, uh, and, and then that fell apart. And, you know, of course, we were all crushed when, when, uh, when that went away. Uh, and then, you know, fast forward uh, about another four years later, uh, we had the Clean Power Plan. And again, we took a run at it and, and it didn't work. So for somebody who's been around for so long working in this area, it is absolutely thrilling that we have this legislation. And, and in particular, it's really terrific that it really cuts across every sector of the economy. Uh, it's not just electricity. It's not just transportation. It's not just agriculture. It's not just building. So it, it really is sweeping. So it is just, I, I can't overemphasize how important that is. And, and I could go through the, the list of all the cool things in that legislation, um, but I think we've heard some about that. I have other things I want to talk about. But I will say that taken together, uh, this is anticipated to result in 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. This is a huge contribution. That is by 2030, and it will put us well on the pathway to, uh, to, to 2050 and net zero emissions. But what I want to do just with the time we have here is talk about what I'm excited about uh, in terms of ideas that are driving the policies that are that are made and also how the policies that are implemented. Because at the end of the day, I think that ideas and ideas that are shaping how we think about these problems are really what's going to make the difference, whether we'll get there and, and how we get there and, and the benefits that will accrue from that. So the first idea that I want to talk about is something that we, we've heard about today, and, and that's equity. And, and I can say from where I sit, equity has a seat at every single table where any conversation is being had about this topic and many other topics. So just what are, what are the kind of equity issues? Pollution burdens, you know, we've, we've heard about that, that the, the, the people of color and low-income communities are 
it's not exposed to much bigger pollution burdens. Um, there are also risks to communities. There are many communities that have grown up around providing uh, fossil fuels, uh, oil fields, gas fields, uh, coal, uh, coal mines, and, and so forth. And as we imagine this transition, you have whole communities that are at, that are at risk. So, so it's really important to, to consider that. Um, there's also diversity. Uh, I can say I'm really privileged to be working in the most diverse environment I've ever worked in really an inspiration for, for, for every company, for every university, and, and it's a lot of work and it doesn't happen, happen alone, but there are so many talented people out there. We just need to find those people, help them get prepared for these jobs and, and provide opportunity. And the other part of this conversation is about uh, energy poverty and that we recognize that low-income uh, communities, low-income families, that they are spending a disproportionate fraction of their income on, on, on getting electricity, on staying warm, on staying cool, really life safety issues. And, and so it's so exciting to, to have this the center of, of the energy policies we're making. And so, so just to, to talk about it, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have ideas, but it's important to implement them. So we've heard about the Justice 40. Uh, initiative, which basically requires that 40% of the investment uh, in, in certain areas, particularly those ones focused on the energy transition, need to be directed to low income uh, and, and communities of color that have experienced disproportionate burdens of pollution. Uh, we also have the, if we look at the leadership across the government, it's just incredibly uh, diverse uh, how it is. And, and the last one I want to highlight is fantastic work the Department of Energy is doing on energy communities. So, so this is you know, literally there are outstanding people going into communities talking about how do you want to transition, what do you want on the other side of this to keep your community strong, to have good quality jobs here. And, and this is a, a, a one of the time community job, an enormous amount of work, but really exciting to see it. And, and already now we're seeing in the states, the states stepping up, a fantastic uh, example from Wyoming, uh, where there's now an incentive for um, uh, creating uh, jobs associated with, uh, with the new clean energy manufacturing jobs, including things like small modular reactors or, or, or micro reactors that could form the foundation for the advanced manufacturing. So that's one. Um, the, the second thing I think is so important I'm really excited about is that we're really focusing on a diversity of solutions, right? You know, at, at times in this discussion, it's been sort of a one size fits all. Uh, here's you know here's the menu of, of solutions and you know and, and I always found that problematic and that maybe that solution set of solutions wasn't the one that communities wanted or or maybe they didn't have the resources that would be available for those set of solutions so so if we look at the at the, at the infrastructure law and, and the Inflation Reduction Act the solar wind geothermal biofuels hydro. Uh, Energy storage, hugely important. We've heard a lot about that today. Hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, advanced nuclear, uh, uh, long duration, uh, long duration energy storage, low carbon products. You know, just making things completely differently so we can avoid those emissions. And and now even we're beginning to hear uh, about fusion. And not only that, we're continuing to invest in, in, in groundbreaking innovation that's going to create more options. So I think that's incredibly important and much more likely to lead to success. Another idea that, that has found its time is that we're now framing this in terms of aligning multiple objectives as we solve the climate problem. So yes, we need to reduce emissions, so the climate impacts are important. Uh, but yes, we also need to think the, about the environment. We need to think about air quality. We need to think about water. We need to think about ecosystems uh, because you don't always have that alignment. We need to think about equity. We need to think about the economy and jobs, and we need to think about national and energy security. And, and now, finally, we're at the point where we're aligning all of these objectives, and I think that's key to durable solutions. And, and just one more uh, that I'm excited about, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, uh, and that is a systems perspective. You know, so often, you know, a while ago, we would look at individual technologies. We would look at solar, we would look at wind, we would look at a battery, we would look at, you know, EVs. 
um, which is great. We needed to do that. But in reality, the energy system is, is a system, and it's a system of systems, and it's the interconnections between the system will make or break whether that's going to work. So we have to think about how the pieces are fitting together, and we're doing that now. We need to think about supply chains, and we also need to think about systemic innovation, not just for technology, but for finance, policy, as well as social, social innovation that would make sure that we can do this fairly uh, and with opportunity for everyone. So the power of ideas, the time is now. Well, that's great. And that's a great sort of segue into the system that actually extends beyond the federal government into sort of what is the private sector doing and what are some of the, how are some of the states going to respond to these policies? So maybe, David, you could speak a bit about that connected tissue. You bet, and I think it's a, it's a good segue. I'll try to be brief. I just take a few points, though. Um, we worked on many parts of the uh, infrastructure bill, the reconciliation bill, uh, for decades, um, in some cases, most, most cases, 10 years, 8 years. So we had a lot of time to think about it. And where we got the ideas and where we moved pieces forward, like carbon management, utilization, transportation, it was the work of North Dakota, Louisiana, Wyoming, we just mentioned in those areas, that really set the table for that. So when we think about um, how we knit these pieces together, we think of not only that, but where does that connect with the hydrogen opportunity? Where does that connect with so many other pieces in the community for workforce? And it's the knitting together of the pieces of these federal opportunities that I think is the challenge. And I would say for everybody here, and I, I think probably a lot of you know this, I think for an action item, whether you're working uh, in a single organization or a geography of the state or, uh, or at the federal level, figuring out how we knit those pieces together to leverage them, I think, is our challenge. Um, and we're doing it in the backdrop um, of that energy poverty issue. You know, something like 50% of the population um, is you know, able to deal with the energy costs we have, most of the people in this room. The other 50%, it's impacting their lives, their food, and their health, their everything um, from an affordability perspective. So we have to balance um, these two in some way. It's not the transition to clean energy that's causing that, but it has to be part of the solution of what we're doing. So when we think of other examples about how policy is impacted, the grid um, resilience funds that are coming out of the Department of Energy's uh, grid program, for example, uh, the states get a formula portion, there's also a competitive portion, there's a private sector portion. Um, there are a lot of great projects that people have in mind, um, but those are projects. In some cases, they're very simple. Um, projects, vegetation management, hardening, infrastructure, those are good things. Those should be part and parcel of what we do every day. So a policy leap is thinking about how do we use those projects and those dollars to change how public and private investment go forward. As much money as this is, and as big an opportunity as it is, um, it's endorsed the amount we need, not only from a climate perspective, but just from a global competitiveness perspective. Um, this last comment on workforce, we have a demographic situation in every developed country in the world, and I would say I would include in that certainly China, that is sort of abysmal from a historic perspective. We're all getting older. How do we develop not just workforce bodies, but workforce talent? And I think that's our limiting factor, that and getting these pieces together and doing it in a way that we can hopefully get along. Thanks. That's great. And you, you got an extra point for doing the action item early. So Bobby, uh, and let's turn it to you. Great. Well, uh, there's several things now, but I have this microphone. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, so, um, and these may sound like two disparate issues, but I am going to say that uh, we're going into COP. Um, we haven't yet really mentioned that. And I think it's really an interesting moment because we're going into a time when we are internationally fraught with a lot of issues that can sort of disrupt how we look at energy globally. And we know that um, what happens just in terms of gas in Germany and in Europe is going to affect us, our own production, our own costs, and how we look at things. So I think that you know, as we think about ourselves today in the United States, we have to keep that global perspective out there and, and, and recognize all the global equity issues and not get diverted. And I think it was really important that the IEA stated that the Ukrainian uh, situation should be seen as an opportunity and, and move forward on clean energy, not deter us, even though we're going to have um, some very bad immediate times, which gets me into something that I hope that you'll talk about, which is just the increasing cost of, of energy as we go into the winter and we can talk equity and we can talk all of these issues, but you know, when a pe people have to pay the bill, as you say, uh, 
and even defer costs over a long period of time, that's when clean energy may or may not come up against some other uh, exigencies. But the only other comment that I want to make is living on the East Coast now, we've become very involved with offshore wind. And we have some real experts in the room. Um, our Undersecretary of Energy from Massachusetts is here as an ambassador. And this issue of offshore wind offers a huge amount of opportunity and complexity. And I know how DOE is stepping up to the plate and, and Undersecretary Kogan and with what you're working on. But it's a real issue and an opportunity for the feds and the states to work together. And I have one issue that really moves large for me that just to raise a clean energy perspective is the development of an offshore energy grid, um, a backbone that reaches from North Carolina to Maine. And how do we think about it? How do we govern it? How, what do we have to put in place as we're making decisions today on infrastructure? And then that brings us into a broader issue of transmission. And on, on transmission, we have all of the same issues that we've touched on. So I think that part of this panel, we have to raise these issues and have that conversation as well. Um, you know, I think what I would add is a couple of things. First is like the, the understanding that all of this is connected um, and beyond just the energy system. Right? And so if I think about an earlier presentation, we talked about digital transformation. What we're really talking about when we think about efficiency is we're talking about access to broadband. People's ability to participate is driven by their access to broadband. And that means can I afford broadband? And I don't know about everybody else in this room, but I know what I pay for broadband every single month, and it is not cheap. Um, but also, right, how do you build out middle mile from this? So understanding the connectedness of these issues in a way that we can move forward. Um, the second thing I would say that, that in the end, that I feel challenged by, I think, as well excitement is we have historic investments being made. How are we measuring our success and when are we measuring our success? Because oftentimes I think my sense is that we make big investments and then we wait until the end and we take a look back to see how well we did. And the reality is that if we wait until we get to the end, it's too late. If we didn't do well, what are we going to do? Right? And so as we're, as the government, as the administration, the agencies, we at the Alliance try to support, build out the rules. I think there has to be a triggering like that says every year, 18 months, 24 months, whatever that timing is. We need to take a look back and make sure that what we think these policies are going to do, they actually are going to do them. And if they're not doing it, then what is our opportunity to pivot um, away, to build something new, to supplement, et cetera, I think. Um, all of that is really important. And then the last thing I would say is, and to David's point, we have historic investments being made. Um, it's not enough money. And we have to understand and fully, I think, appreciate that when we think about equities and communities that have been left behind, they haven't been left behind just in one area. They've been left behind in a whole bunch of areas. And so part of the role of equity and community engagement is allowing the community to lead and when you allow a community to lead one, that is not a fast process. And we talked this morning about the urgency of the time that we're in. Yet the process that we need to use is not one that you use when you have urgency, right? right? And so how are we gonna like think about that and balance those? And I do think you allow communities to lead, but we have to, I think, be very thoughtful about like those kinds of dynamics. Um, and then thinking about the investment, not only in those localities and states that are chasing after these dollars, but what happens to those who don't, or who chased and did not get it, right? And so how are we going to still, it's not like those needs went away, but we still have these needs now, we've got to figure out how are we going to invest in these communities because we started from a place that said, no community will be left behind. Right. And I can tell you just from the structure, there are lots of ways that communities can be left behind. There are, left, I mean, there are tons of different ways. And so um, not to be the Debbie Don, Downer, and I think a time that we should all be really excited. But I also will say is that we are playing chess, not checkers. And if we are not thinking about this hard stuff now, 2035 is too late, 2040, 2050, we're just really winging it and hoping that we get there as opposed to really doing, I think, the kind of diligent work that requires to make sure that we have those outcomes. 
So that's a great point. And I think it speaks to some of the tension between the time and the outcomes we're trying to achieve. And I think uh, we touched on it, but maybe didn't get into uh, the resilience side of this, which is, you know, you're investing all this money. I think that, you know, an offshore grid speaks to some extent to that longer term um, and, and resilience of outcome that you're trying to achieve. Anyone have any more they want to say on the, the resilience, you know, side of this coin? In terms of the deploying these clean energy strategies quickly. Well, I'll just I would add real quickly. The resilience piece is enormous, obviously. These different things to different people, different contexts. When I think about the wildfires we yes. through the West yes. as an example, obviously we know what that means. We have a, a combination of affordability and resilience issue emerging in New England this winter that, that some are well aware of that yeah. we are very concerned about. I think where those two meet, um, where people will be left behind is, as a result of not only the absolute price of energy, but the rapid increase of it. And I think um, I think we have to really reevaluate what the cost benefit means. And I don't mean that in a regulatory context. I mean it in a policy making context of what are we willing to tolerate in different areas in terms of investment of rebuilding again and again without proper building codes of of uh, building a grid that isn't uh, well distributed as best it can be and and all of those elements but in particular the more vulnerable part of communities yes. not only from an income or diversity perspective but also from they're critical to making our society function and i think i don't think we've dug down on the risk piece of this in a way that uh, it really speaks to the sort of societal benefits as opposed to does it pencil out the right thinking that is the wrong lens mm -hmm. yes and i'll add a little bit about that you know, the, the climate is changing quickly. It's revealing, you know, vulnerabilities in coastal communities and, and, and areas from the flooding. And and I think a very important idea that's been introduced to the part of the solution set is nature-based solutions, you know, that we can't engineer ourselves out of every system where we're fighting nature, that we need to work with nature. So we need to think about what are those areas where, you know, harnessing the potential of, you know, restoring coastal ecosystems and how that will help protect communities against uh, uh, storms and so forth. And it provides a lot of other co-benefits in terms of restoring uh, fisheries and so forth. So I think that's an important idea and, and there's a huge opportunity through this legislation to that. Uh, Solutions. Yeah, good point. Before I go to the audience, any other comments on that on our panel? I guess I would like to say because you brought up the issue of New England, and since that's something that you know I have lived for over thirty years, well, my question has to do with how we make decisions. This is partially you know an issue of equity and diversity, but. Who's in the room when these decisions are made? And what, not only who's in the room, but what type of power do, do people have in, in, in facing these situations? And um, when we made certain decisions about gas infrastructure in New England, and we, we can't let our goal for clean energy get derailed. And, and I turn to you to ask you, Paul, a sort of, you know, Based on all the work that you're being that that you've done and, and your organization, how do we look at this when we talk of innovation and a more innovative approach? Um, it, it's it's difficult, but you know what would be innovation in decision making in addition to innovation in technology? You know, I think. That's a really good question. I think <laughs> that, you know, the, the thing about decision making and innovation and decision making it is being okay with the outcome when you don't get to make the choice. And I think when we talk about diversity and, and equity and decision making and community engagement, what we often, I think, what we need is education and how do I convince a community that what I want to do for them is the right thing for them. They are clear that that's what we're doing. We are clear that that's what we're doing, even though we call it some different stuff. And what you're suggesting, right, is that if they're at the table and they actually get to make the decision, which means that we don't get to come in right, and engage with communities about what we believe is right for them, but that we get to come and ask them what is right for them. And then we have to accept that what they say is right for them may not be anything in our heads. What do we do next? Right, I think real engagement and, and allowing voices to be heard demands that we use that type of process. And I think it changes our thinking because I think we, and this is a collective we, 
um, walk into lots of different types of communities believing that we know we have the solution. I think that happens all the time. Um, and we walk away with communities being really disgruntled, not engaged, unhappy with us, sometimes irritated and pissed off with us because, uh, to be frank, they feel like they got fooled. They thought we were coming in to really hear from them, but really we were doing what we always do. And so that, but that doesn't work in a time of urgency, right? right? Like that's, I think that's the push pull that we have to, to get. And I would also suggest that all of us collectively, when we talk about diversity, we should talk about diversity as what it gives for us as opposed to what we're doing for them. Because reality is more diverse employees, I can tell you this from being at the Alliance for two years, greater diversity in the Alliance has made us a better organization, full stop in every single way. It had not, like the goal of diversity had nothing to do with it, but bringing on all these people who actually thought completely different from each other and from me made us a better organization. And I think as we think about growing a clean energy economy and system, what we should be saying is, those who are not here is only making us worse. It's actually, you know, right? We need them because we want to be better. And so it's, it's a little bit of how you change your mindset, but also how you communicate that in a way that people actually feel like they're going to be wrong and that their opinions are going to be valued. And I would say all of us as women know what it feels like when someone asks you a question, you provide them your opinion, and then you are informed by the way they react. They actually had no interest in your opinion. <laughs> we all know what that feels like. And so we have that empathetic gene that we can then use for something else. And trying to, trying to manage that tension between offering solutions and actually really hearing and listening, I think that that's the key. And we do need to find a way to do that better, I'm sure. So let me make sure that we have some time because I know that Maria will tell me that our time is up soon. So why don't I ask if anyone in the audience would like to ask some questions? Okay, how about right there first and second? Here. Uh, David, thank you so much for being here from a state perspective. Uh, with 50 states, our utilities are regulated differently everywhere. So uh, great news about all the funding coming in. What advice do you have for us in the room across our hopefully almost 50 states um, to help the utility, the regulators move forward? They tend to lag technology. So what uh, suggestions do you have for us that we can make a difference in each of our states? Yeah, I think it's a good side of the push by that on. <laughs> Hang on, okay. Um, it's a good question, and there are 56 in like the states, territories, DC. So we've, we've got everybody. I think both regulated and unregulated utilities. I would add, but I think in the regulatory space in particular, the, the this is where I make the distinction between policy and regulation. Both important pieces, two sides of the coin. I think often the utility conversation and the state conversation is described by the regulatory one, which is which is responding to policy changes. And I think we need to amp up, pardon the pun, significantly. The discussion on the policy side. We saw from an energy office perspective a decade ago uh, that EVs were coming and we began preparing for it a decade ago. One of the reasons why they think the joint office between the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, the state highway transportation officials and our members is going so well. We worked together on those topics for a decade in one way, shape or form or another. So I think when you go back home to think about engaging your energy office, your governor's office on a policy discussion about where are we headed? What are we investing in? What are the companies in our community investing? What do our communities want and need? And focus on that as opposed to the more the traditional conversation we have. And you know this already, but I think I, I could do that all day long. It's the right, it's the right approach, I think. Yeah. So can I just interrupt on that point? Because I've been a PUC commissioner, I worked for utility, and then I went back on the policy side. The issue oftentimes, and this is really frustrating, is that the regulatory piece deeply lags. It's very legalistic. Um, it's very process driven. And so even if you want to make change, it's very difficult to increase innovation. For example, you want to do something in the utility space, but the utility is gun shot. It's difficult. And I guess, you know, for me, the question is, what do we do on a process side, A, to include people and, and you know, and, and 
a notice in the newspaper that you're going to have a change in rates doesn't really do it um, <laughs> for you. <laughs> reading that, it's, you know, like reading the obituaries, they're not going to be doing that normally. So I, I guess my question to you is, it's, it, it, what, from the process and the regulatory side, that to me is where we really need to do some work. And, and have you thought about how we do it? Yeah, well, I, a couple of comments without getting into right. to regulatory reinvention. I think we often ask regulators to do what policymakers should do. We often ask policymakers to do what regulators should do. That's the having them together part. If you, I always use the example, if we didn't, if, you, if you'd never heard of a renewable electricity standard, you went to bed and had a dream tonight and came up with it, would you A, go ask the regulators to develop that, or would you B, go to the policymakers and all the things that have to be done in advance of that to let the regulators know that's where you're headed so that they can deal with the issue? And that, and that doesn't solve it, but it is, I find more often we have people coming to us, at least in our case, with a regulatory question, which is really great. We'd love to opine on it, but probably they should talk to a different group. And vice versa, and I and I do think there is some of that, and I and I am always shocked at the um, among the advocacy community, for example, that that distinction isn't well understood. And it, it it's actually reasonably uniform state to state. It's not it's not one of those things that's different everywhere. That's kind of, that construct is true, and both sides have to work together. It's one of the reasons I should add real quickly. We have this fantastic relationship with utility commissions through neighbor, and we have all these joint partnerships, which probably you know expire the bandwidth of everybody, but. It's really critical that they talk together. Okay. All right. Let's have another question. Yeah, we're going to go maybe five minutes. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Hi, Chris Lafleur with San Diego National Laboratories. Um, I wonder if the deep policy thinkers will handle a philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but can you reflect on capitalism and how it needs to evolve in order to enable all these noble things? <laughs> like like equity and access to energy yeah. and clean energy that has to be profitable in order to be implemented, right? right? Like how can capitalism drive equitable solutions to climate change? So we have five minutes left. <laughs> Them this off for this. Capitalism has to drive equitable solutions to climate change because this is that's the function that we have, right? We we are, you know so we live in a capitalist society. Um, I would suggest that you have lots of companies who I think are driving equity and climate at the same time, and you have others who aren't. And so, in my mind, your question really speaks to like how do we speed that up, amplify it, and it get evolve? to scale, and how do you evolve it? I think we do that. I think we do that. And I would say the, the one step, as a person who, I will be transparent, right? I serve on an oil gas company board. So I, I do clean, but I also, um, we have <laughs> not to, no, but seriously, because I hear it all across the time, the rhetoric that we use about each other and other sectors of the industry makes it almost impossible for us to get the solution and work together if we're going to, demonize somebody who works in oil and natural gas. If someone, oil, and I will tell you, I've had oil people tell me that my colleagues are going to hate me because I've joined this. They're like, your colleagues are never going to speak to you again. We have got to stop all of that. We just have to. Like, we share this planet. And so if we're not going to, and we know emotionally, like, language matters. Um, I would suggest if we can get past that one thing, I think that would go so much farther for us to be able to actually come to the solutions together. Others? Just to add real quickly, I, I agree with Paul 100%. I think that's one of the, I'm sorry. I, I agree with Paul 100%. I think that's one of the challenges there. And this is probably more of a personal comment, which I should know better than debate. But I read a lot of monetary economics in my spare time, so I really like the question. But, but I, think, I think we have to from another perspective. I, I'm one of those people, at least, that believes firmly that the, the capitalist approach is the way we get this done. I think in places that, that, that don't have that element or don't least have those thematic elements, we have misallocation of capital. And so we have to ask more, obviously, of companies, but also of ourselves, of investors, of those that can afford to, about how we invest. And we have to definitely include you know, that entire panoply of, of solutions, including oil and gas. So I, I, think, I think we have to ask, of, ask that of capitalism, but we have to use that method. I still think another, another approach is going to get us from A to B on climate um, or on a lot of other economic issues without it. Bobby, did you have something? Uh, no, I, I so know. Yes. Okay. So just, all right. Did you have something you wanted to add? 
I, I will say that I think, you know, my, my two cents on this is that because we work across all these different sectors and commercial, state, local, and federal, I think often our, our best opportunity is to find where there's something inequitable happening with money that's flowing and try to bring that to the fore and figure out. So for instance, if you're giving incentives for energy efficiency programs and it's, it's to encourage me to do something differently, maybe I'm not the target audience. Maybe it should be someone and maybe we should, we're not using those incentives appropriately. So how do you use sort of efficient efficiency and an equity lens with money that is flowing through sort of that typical capitalist sort of program? And I think that has been pretty, pretty useful. It's similar in the energy resilience work we do for utilities. They were doing energy resilience work because we were demonstrating it was worth the money, not because they had actually anyone paying for it yet. So um, anyway, it's just, but I, I feel like there are ways in, um, but maybe I'm just an optimist. <laughs> so um, anyway, I would wanna say thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you for your preparations. Thank you for being here today. I think you were very provocative. Thanks to those in the audience. And if you have questions, I'm sure folks would love to talk to you individually.